the Lisa's on with us tonight. Yeah, she said... Uh, uh, our music intern. You know, she was uh, feeling a little better. If she feels up to it, she'll call up. Otherwise, she'll be in the uh, chat room. Well, she's in the chat room, the music intern. So we're going to have to play some music tonight. You know, when we did all that arguing. Now we, we got nothing to say before the show. Well... You get angry. I don't get angry when these things happen. I just do it to stimulate their conversations. I guess I should wait till the show starts to stimulate them. You know, I'm a I'm a Hillary hater, and uh, Mark was a was a uh, Bernie supporter, and he switched over to Hillary. Now, if if, if uh, What's, what's his name? Bernie went probably on the uh, on uh, Julie Stein's uh, party, the Green Party. He might have had a better chance to win. Yeah, but Bernie didn't want. Bernie doesn't want to be second banana. You know, Jill Stein wants to be the president. You know, so does Bernie. Now, I, you know, the bottom line with Bernie is I know he hasn't done much in Congress, but he has been a voice for uh, you know liberals and progressives being an independent, and being a socialist. Look, he makes no bones about the fact yeah. that he's a socialist. Yeah. You know, you know, so, so uh, democratic socialist. You know, Bush was uh, a compassionate conservative. I thought that was Reagan. No, Bush was, Bush was a compassionate conservative. He was the one to really use the term. Oh, the, old, the old Bush. No, the son. The son? Yeah, compassionate conservative. Okay, I forgot. My father the... used to say, what's a compassionate conservative? You know, conservatives don't want to give you anything. You know, but, uh, you know, what can I say? But, um, you know, it's funny. You know, the, 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 I have a, you know, Trump is going to be somewhere between a Republican and a Democrat because to do the things he wants to do, he needs the support of the, well, the Democrats, and he'll have an easier time getting support from Democrats than he will from conservatives. Uh, I don't know, not the way Schumer's talking. Well, I, you know, well, but Schumer said, you know, if he's talking infrastructure, he'll have our support, you know. Um, yeah, if, if, if it means spending money, well, he'll have our support. If it means taking away money, well, but we won't how be else, support. You know, don't forget when when uh, when the stimulus package was proposed by uh, Obama, uh, Paul Krugman, a bunch of other uh, uh, economists said the problem was he didn't go far enough in order to stimulate the economy the way it should have been stimulated. It should have reached a trillion dollars and there was no way Obama knew that there was no way that the Republicans were going to foot the bill for a trillion dollars now not only the Republicans but the blue dog Democrats who were worried about their own jobs you know being reelected obviously that they were going to have a tough time because you know there's an old cliche you know to uh to make money, you got to be able to spend money. You got to spend money like you don't miss it. You know, you have to invest. Well, to invest in the future of America and create these jobs, money had to be invested. And the Republicans just didn't want to invest the money. Okay, and that's why you had the recession that you had in 2008 into 2009. I don't think that money would have helped that much at that point already anymore. And there's some people say we would still be even better off to let some of those... You know, they, the Democrats talked about retraining people who were laid off. But you're not talking about young people, for the most part, in their 30s or even into their early 40s who don't mind being retrained and learning how to use modern technology in, in, in the 21st century. 
okay? You're talking about people in their 50s, for the most part, even into their very early 60s. And these people, don't, they, they can't be, they, they don't want to be retrained. They don't want to go back to school. You know, they go back to school for a, you know, you're 60 years old, you go back to school for a couple of years, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a job for you. You know? That's true. It's, it's, it's tough being laid off when you're in your 40s and 50s and you're competing for jobs with people who are in their 30s. You know? And that's why people lost their homes, they lost their savings. The jobs that Trump is talking about, if they, if it comes to be, he's talking about machinists, he's talking about construction workers, these were the jobs that were lost when it comes to rebuilding the infrastructure and rebuilding America. But you still have to have people trained on the new technology because a lot of this stuff is automated and you need computer programmers who know a little bit of both who can do that, you know, and I don't know if somebody 50 years old is willing to sit behind a keyboard just the way you are right now, Rev, and uh, pushing a button that tells a bunch of uh, machines what they have to do. You know. Well, listen, when you're doing construction work, it's manual labor. You can't get away from that. Well, I, you know, I'm referring more to uh, the manufacturing jobs when it came to, uh, the, you know, the cars, the assembly lines and everything, you know. Well, yeah, there's, it's a lot less. Yeah, but it's been, been, that's been computers for a long time, assembly lines. Bottom line is... Just think, you know. They don't want next to... week. Next week, you could have some. You can have a robot coming through that door on Friday and, and saying live. And say, exactly. I am the doc. I am the rev. <laughs> then there won't be any arguing. <laughs> the uh, look, things are just going to be different. First thing, I think one of the things he said uh, it was 99 is one cent rule Trump had. The what? One cent rule. What? Everybody in the government has got to spend 99 cents instead of a dollar from before. Now, they got to take off 1%, one, 1 cut their 1% sp in spending and anything they spent. If you used to, cost, if you used to spend a dollar on it, now you got to make it work for 99 cents. One cent rule. I'm not sure I understand that fully, but okay. In other words, cut down and cut down on your expenses by one percent. Everybody. Just cut down your expenses. Renegotiate the deals. Tell them you're only well, then give, tell them you're gonna give them ninety nine cents on a dollar. Most contractors will be glad to lose only one penny and keep a contract. No, that's very true. But over the whole government, that's billions, that's millions of dollars saved. I mean, the government spends, you know, spends so much money, 1% less is, is going to make a big difference. You know, he, he also promised to save them you know, money. In it. So it's going to be hard to do both. Spend and save. That's why he's got to bring the people from the outside for the, you know, for, to bring them back into the country. He's need, he needs that money, and the only incentive you can give him is uh, they're going to save some money by being here. A centavo. In centavo, what country? Who has the highest corporate rate in the world? Well, taxes. we have the highest corporate exactly. rate in the world. So well, why would well, corporation? Uh, yeah, well, he was talking about. Which I could understand, lowering the corporate rate from 35%. To 15. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah, you mentioned 15. Well, but, that's what that's his proposal, 15. You know, it, would certainly, it would certainly make uh, you know, us competitive with other countries. Yeah, because you got to bring that 15, Somebody's but our labor. On. 
Oh, wait a sec. We've got somebody on call. We have somebody on, on the phone. <laughs> Yo, who's that hey. line? Hey, this is Ed, your anti-federalist friend. How we doing? Hey. Hey, how are you? How's how are everything? You, States' rights. Good, man. Good. Yeah, actually, people's rights. First People, comes, well, uh, right. Trial by jury. Right. You know, have you the been? Right, the, the, the rights reserved, Ninth and Tenth Amendments. That's that's our unalienable rights. You know, they're the best things. In fact, what makes America great and our pre- past, our our president now and our president in the future, the two things I say make America great is the right to bear arms and the right to burn the flag. And you know, guess what? When Obama says I'm going to try to regulate their right to bear arms, guess what happened? All the citizens went out. We got more guns and more weapons sold than any time in history. So we just you thumb their nose at Mr. Obama, and now. Uh, Mr. Trump's coming and saying, I think you should have to go to jail for a year if you burn the flag. And every day they're out there burning flags in front of Trump Tower. There's been more flags burned in the last week since he, or four days since he said that. Well, I know one, so of, the, one, of, the, one of the politicians yeah. said that he, he needs a lesson in, uh, you know, high school yeah, civics, you know, he because... I don't even know what the Constitution is. This guy's an idiot. <laughs> Although I voted for him, I don't want Hillary in there. She's a Marxist. But you know, I have an idiot in there. Enough. What makes don't forget what makes America great also is the fact, and this is where, you know, going to be a lot of problems with the Supreme Court and everything with the interpretation of the Constitution. That the founding fathers, when they wrote up the Constitution, understood that over time things change. And you can have an amendment to the Constitution brought up, okay, uh, which basically changes the whole meaning depending upon the society in which we live. Um, The fact that, well, Scalia and a bunch of others were strict uh, interpreters of what the Founding Fathers wanted. But then you have, on the other side, you have judges who say, okay, but things change, and don't you want to enable the Constitution to grow or change along with the, the uh, society in which it's being interpreted, you know? Um, and that's going to be the problem with, uh, you know, the next couple of appointments, uh, I don't see, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people are talking about the next appointment, whatever, uh, whomever it's going to be, and I don't see a problem with the next one, because you know the next one is going to be conservative like Scalia, and all that's going to do is make the uh, Supreme Court basically just the way it was before, where you hope that maybe one of the judges might change their mind instead of voting one way, they'll vote another way, just the way uh, Chief Justice Roberts did when he uh, finally said uh, when the Republicans couldn't do away with Obamacare because he said, as it's structured, you know, this is it, it basically okay. But the second appointment that Trump's, Trump makes will definitely probably tilt the court one way or the other. Okay. Well, if it's his appointment, it's going to, be, it's going to tilt it to the right. Well, you know, it's, he's not going to—he's not going to appoint the liberal. Well, I, I know that. That's what I'm saying because, well, I said people are talking about the next appointment. The next appointment is just going to put us back where we were before when Scalia was still alive, okay? But should Ruth Bader Ginsburg's health begin to fail and she can't continue, her replacement, the nominee, will make the difference as far as swaying the court one way or the other. Well, let me ask you. You said you, you know, you don't. The the, the founding fathers, uh, you know, made the amendments available to us so we could make changes, right? Mm-hmm. What changes would you like in the Constitution? I'm not. I'm. I'm not a student yeah. of the Constitution. I know a couple of the amendments. You know, I mean, I'm not saying one way or the other. I mean, it would take 
studying and reading and 